good morning and welcome to Men's Leadership Network. Uh, Nick Allen and Chase Baker here Hello. to co-host for you this morning. I want to say a special welcome to our satellite locations. We've got guys at Bricks and Cool Springs, Highway 55 in Nolensville, and Nashville at Flavor Catering. Awesome. So a few weeks ago, I'm going to introduce this guy to you. I'm really excited about David Shedd. A few weeks ago, um, David had opportunity to go and speak at a men's retreat that, that we were at, and uh, just an incredible man of, of God. It was, it was great to just sit, sit down with him, just get to know him. So he actually got to sit down with Pastor Jeff and do an interview with him that we're going to show today. And just to let you know a little bit about David um, and his background, I mean, his, his resume is, is a long resume. I won't go over it all, but heeding the call to service, he began a work in government, and he spent his career working in several top positions in the CIA, which is, we all dream about oh, being yeah. spies and stuff like that when we were little. <laughs> I still do. Um, the U.S. Embassy in Costa Rica, the Embassy in Mexico City. He was a special assistant to the president and worked at the White House from 2001 through 2005 before retiring as his at, at a post as the um, director of the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, so needless to say, David has seen a lot during his career. And, but more importantly than the CIA, everything he's done in the CIA, CIA secrets and the covert missions and all the stuff that we dream about, David has seen the power and the peace of God in the most trying circumstances. As you hear today, he consistently and intentionally shares his faith with those that he works with. And we see, and throughout his career, um, he's seen God, God's hand at, at work throughout his career whenever he, he shares his faith. So what you're going to hear from is, is a guy who, whose faith is steadfast, even in the most uncertain times. And, um, yeah, so. Yeah. So as you watch today, we are still going to take questions that you might have regarding the interview. Um, so the audience and the guys at the other locations can send those in to, they can email questions at mensleadershipnetwork.com or post them on Twitter at leadership underscore net. Um, however, because David is not here live to answer those questions this morning, uh, what you're going to get is Chase and I fielding those questions about how we intend to apply the things that we hear today. So it's going to be a great morning. We're really excited about it. So let's begin. Well, David, thanks for joining us today, and uh, just really appreciate you. And I know you've, man, been the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency and uh, been working in um, government for a long time. But before we get into that, tell us a little bit about your spiritual journey. Well, I was born on the mission field in Bolivia in 1959, so that makes it uh, 56, 57 years ago. And the Lord um, blessed me by growing up in a Christian family. And it, in that process, um, I came to know the Lord at the age of five in a tent revival meeting in southern Chile, of all places. So the Lord can even find you there. And, and uh, from there on out, it was uh, one of those lives where um, I grew up in the Word with a, with a father who was a pastor in multiple churches, head of a Bible institute. So the Word was always around us. What I found in the, in the latter years of my life, in the, the last 20 years, let's say, the Lord really speaking to me about the process of sanctification mm -hmm. and really pouring my life into other people's lives rather than being satisfied or self-satisfied, maybe even uh, to use that term, that my spiritual journey was okay just the way that it was. And I think that's come from becoming more steeped in the Word but really turning a heart toward thanksgiving, mm. a heart that says, thank you, Lord, for all that I have. I see so much brokenness all around us. And so the Lord has been working in that process of sanctification, going back those 52 years, mm. but accelerated over time. Yeah. And I give God all the glory for that. I love that. That's awesome, because we're all a work in progress. You know, God's Absolutely. not finished with any of us. No, and we won't be finished on this planet Earth. Yeah. And we have to go to the other side for us to be mm -hmm. completely restored mm -hmm. in that new body as, as Christ has promised and mm -hmm. to, to live with him forevermore. I love that. I love that. Well, tell me about, you know, being a Christ follower, and then how did you get into the CIA? I mean, you were a CIA operative for 30 years. Well, it, um, I sort of stumbled into it, actually. Yeah. I uh, was coming out of graduate school in, um, at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., 
And um, my wife, a school teacher, uh, we were trying to make ends meet. I knew that I was feeling called to go back to Latin America, and I just didn't know what particular platform. I had for many, many years, even before uh, going, going to college, had a real interest in foreign affairs, just what makes the world go around, if you will, sort of a news junkie even at the early age of 10, 12. I just loved the news. And by the way, we didn't even have a television, so we read a lot and we talked about world events. And so I knew that, that the Lord was leading me in that direction. I had changed majors in my undergraduate school from civil engineering, which was really focused on going out and making a lot of money, so mm. I thought, yeah. building a trans-Amazon highway. Mm. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, no, I want you to go toward economics and political science. I had who became my dear wife at the end of my college years, whom I met on my second day in college, influencing me spiritually all along that, that part of the journey. So I applied to two places, the State Department, as I like to say, the other State Department. And uh, one offered me a job first. That's the part that was no more planned than that. Yeah. And they offered it to me to be an intern originally in 1982, in the summer of 82, while I was at Georgetown, and I le never left. I finished Georgetown, but I worked part-time and, and uh, finished my, my master's degree in foreign affairs and Latin American studies. So it was, a, it, it was, you didn't go on the internet in 1981, 1982 to figure this out, but rather it was really trial by, by testing and learning sort of as I went mm. what this was all about. Wow. So tell us about your time in the CIA. I mean, what did, did you travel? I mean, what was it like being a... Well, it, it, for those who are of our age group, remember there was a war in Central America with mm. Nicaragua. There was a war in Afghanistan after the Soviets had invaded Afghanistan. There were other proxy wars with the Soviet Union and the United States in places like Angola, Yemen. And a lot of my colleagues went to different places. The, uh, the flagship of that effort, of course, was Afghanistan in defeating the Soviets there. I went to Central America very quickly after my training because when I had the language, and two, I was ready to go. I was ready to sign up and help defeat the Soviet Union in whatever way uh, we could. I saw it as a period not fully appreciating what the 1970s had been like. Coming into the Reagan era, I was really excited about the leadership role that the United States could play. Mm -hmm. And so the career developed around Latin America for the natural draw that I had. And, uh, and, and contributing, again, to the defeat of the Soviet Union. And, and to me, that, that was accomplished, obviously, by, the, by 1989, 1990, and the eventual fall and the breakup of the Soviet Union. The career then progressed in different areas where I decided that perhaps the Lord was showing me other opportunities to serve, and, and I did so in the Far East then, um, never learned the languages such as Mandarin, uh, but I enjoyed expanding my horizons uh, professionally into other areas of the world, facing different problems in Latin America, and so that developed. But I had this one thing, and it's very important to know, so this urging from within, that intelligence alone, which was my career, was not a sufficient condition for me to explain the world. I wanted to get to where policy intersected with intelligence. That is, how decisions are made by the president using, or in some instances, ignoring intelligence for the policy decision, which the intelligence professional does not make. He or she just brings that recommendation based on the evaluation and the assessments of, of the situation. It's the president that makes the decision, notwithstanding sometimes that counsel being ignored. Uh, as, as we know from historical examples. So my passion was to get to the White House, which is where that intersection takes place. Mm -hmm. And in 2001, in February of that year, I had that opportunity to do so and work at the National Security Council staff and, and eventually be the senior director for intelligence under George W. Bush, the son, mm -hmm. uh, for nearly five years. Now, what all did your job entail being the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency? 
Well, if you fast forward in my career, that begins in September of 2010, and what that entailed was uh, uh, leadership of a workforce of about 16,500 men and women, uh, uh, located in 130 countries in the world, and as those who are listening to this will know full well, in a time of war, a war in Iraq after 2003, and obviously from 9-11, basically by October, we are in a full war scenario in Afghanistan. Yeah. So a lot of the personnel of DIA uh, located outside of Washington, D.C., and leading that organization against a backdrop of uh, tightening budgets after 20, uh, 2009, 2010, the transition from a former president, George W. Bush, as I talked about, to President Obama, in 2009, uh, when he takes office, a very different direction in terms of uh, what we heretofore had been calling the war on terror, a very different uh, approach to it, the closure of Guantanamo, which DIA helped run uh, by way of, of understanding what we could get from these detainees, on um, better understanding the motivations and the plans and intentions of, of, uh, of those who wish to, to kill us uh, as Islamic extremists. Um, on the other hand, Jeff, it was far less exciting than you might think. It's running an agency and it's running a big corporate structure with very competing demands, mm -hmm. where I like to say 95% of my time was spent on 5% of the personnel problems, fighting for the budget, mm -hmm. getting the budget right and allocated correctly to the challenges that we would face and actually not very operational once you're in those jobs because you have other people that, of course, do the operational work, the analysis, and that within those 16,500, mm. both deployed abroad and sitting in Washington. Wow. Well, you know, when you were with Bush or when you were with Obama, uh, what was your best day in government? When was your best day when you just felt like... Uh, man, we're, we're really making a difference here, you know? Or maybe sometime in, that, in your 30-year career, you know? What was that? Well, I, if I had to pick a single day, it's November 9th, 1989, and people are, are taken aback. How could that be that seven years after you start your career and, and you go on to have many, many more years in government? And I single out that day because it's somewhat symbolic to me, and that's the fall of the Berlin Wall. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was a historical day that if I go back to what I said previously, the idea of setting the stage in what was my motivation to join government, whether it was with the State Department or CIA, it really was the beginning of the culmination of that phase of my career that saw an opportunity as the, as the crumbling of the wall took place, but then the disintegration of the Soviet Union for the next two to three years. It didn't happen immediately in the same way as the wall mm. started coming down between uh, West and East Berlin in Germany. But, Jeff, this is what I want to underscore. Mm. What I saw, and I saw it vividly, yeah. was an opportunity for the gospel to go forward behind literally enemy lines. Wow. And, and don't, don't let me even suggest that God wasn't at work with the underground church. Of course he was, yeah. as he is in places in the world today. Mm -hmm. But speaking from a human standpoint, the idea that the gospel could go into Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. or as I affectionately call it, the stands in that lower tier countries of Uzbekistan and Karikistan and all the stands in Georgia and the Caucasus, and then the Soviet Union, Russia itself, mm -hmm for a period of time. By the way, a window that's closing in Russia right now as we speak, as, as Vladimir Putin is, is, is demanding that all the NGOs and any faith-based organization register where all their money comes from. It's a form of shutting down mm. the presence that we have had as missions mm. in carrying out the great commission that Jesus mm -hmm. ordained for us, mm. commanded us to do, to not only witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, mm -hmm. your Samaria, mm -hmm. in the near abroad, yeah. but also to the uttermost parts of the world. And so that was perhaps my greatest day. Mm -hmm. That doesn't take away from great days with the president, mm -hmm. wonderful events, world leaders that I've met, been able to witness to, to individuals who would never darken the frame of a church, mm -hmm. 
and of a different faith or no faith at all, so they claimed. Um, so, no, many other opportunities. Yeah. But that November 9th, 1989 is really a pinnacle event for me symbolically. That's huge. That's huge. Hey, David, talk about this. Was there ever a time in your government service, your work, that there was a conflict with your faith, with being a Christ follower? Um, you know, I think for a lot of men, there's always that struggle, that tension that we have at our workplace, being a follower of Jesus. And when did we speak about Christ? And, you know, uh, was there ever a time that you felt there was tension there? Uh, there was um, a, a constant tension of living in the world and not of the world. And I think that's, as you point out, yeah. uh, really generic to anywhere in the secular workplace and the challenges that, that you have. Look, it's no different inside the intelligence organizations, be it CIA or DIA or the NSA or FBI that do security work that it's made up of people with broken lives. Mm. And there's broken lives who then, because of that brokenness, distort truth. And I'm one of those firm believers that truth is under assault. And so the, the biggest struggles I had, uh, which I can't go into in detail because of the classified nature of the examples, but would be where a, 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 an implied effort to uh, suggest that things aren't as bad or in some instances embellish on those things that you knew your listener, the president, the combatant commander in the case of DIA, which is its primary customer, the secretary of defense when it came to DIA, might want to hear. Mm. And you say, no, we're, we're, we must remain completely unbiased to the political implications of this. So an example might well be well, do you really think that Guantanamo detainee is going to return and potentially kill our men and women out in the battlefield again? I mean, he's been in jail now in detention at Guantanamo for seven, eight years. It, 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 really? I mean, is he really going to do that? Yes, he still will do that. He's unrepentant. He will rejoin the fight. So if you have five Taliban leaders who absolutely intend to rejoin the Taliban after a period of time of their turnover. This is with uh, the Bergdahl exchange, which yeah. I believe it was. Notwithstanding, holding firm on, on where we stood on the threat that those individuals possessed, the president still went forward with that decision. I was not about to allow that to be modified and say it wasn't as bad. It's the kind of example that I can give you mm -hmm. where that tension of modifying something that you, to, to, to fit a mold yeah. that you knew your potential customer, in this case the president, might want to be more receptive to, and the meeting might go with him a little better yeah. than otherwise might be the case mm -hmm. when you deliver once again bad news that no, they're not ready for release. So it's an integrity issue. That's Very what it much. comes it's at down the heart to. Of, it's at the heart of it. And, and what I learned and it saw and witnessed over my years is that those who had that proverbial North Star mm. and even more so grounded in the Word of God of what truth really is, mm. they were the much stronger officers by way of their performance, by way of that integrity in carrying out in a manner that was, as the Bible reminds us, to live above reproach. None of us are perfect, no. but certainly living above reproach. Yeah. Well, and I think just with the turbulence that we see in the world today, I mean, that's something that for all men, we've, we've got to make an, a, a priority because how do we not be anxious when we look at the news, when we, you know, go online and, and see what's happening throughout the world, whether it's, you know, Syria or you know, Afghanistan or Iraq or what's happening in Russia. And yeah, how do we not be anxious about that? Well, it's, it's interesting. I've thought a lot about this mm -hmm. because um, maybe it's my middle age years, but I wake up at night mm -hmm. and um, including this morning at, at four in the morning, well before I headed to, uh, to the airport outside uh, Washington, D.C. To, 
to come down to this beautiful city. And, and, I, and I, I very intentionally found things to be thankful for. Mm. And it, it tells us in, in Philippians 4, yeah. 6 through 8, be anxious for nothing. But what's interesting is to what follows from that. So first you have a command. And I don't need a lawyer to actually explain that. Be anxious for nothing. It's literally what that says. Yeah. And there are many, many cause and effect reasons for anxiousness. Hurting families, unemployment, many other things. But sticking to your question about international affairs. I look around the world and as Asaph and David and many, many others, Jeremiah, all pointed out, the unrighteous seem to be prospering. That makes me anxious. Mm when I'm in fact commanded not to be anxious. You go on in that verse and it says, but in prayer and supplication, give thanksgiving in all things. Mm. And I just have to say, God, you are awesome. You, I, I have to recognize that in my own life, there's an absence of thanksgiving. There's an absence of thanksgiving in a prayerful way. Do I pray for my enemies? When I think of Vladimir Putin or Kim Jong-il in, uh, in, uh, or now Kim Jong-un in North Korea, who, who very well could, uh, he just did another missile test, but now successfully from a submarine. And they don't follow OSHA rules. They're, they're going to develop this at great threat to the United States. Be anxious for nothing. Hmm. Pray for the days are evil. We see that in, in other passages like Ephesians 5. And you say to yourself, am I praying for him? Mm. Am I praying that God will show, show himself powerful? Mm. Am I praying for Israel mm -hmm. and the surrounding enemies that they have around them? As God's chosen people, living in apostasy, yes, mm. but still God's covenant people. Mm. And I say, no, Lord, I fail you. Mm. And so how do I manage it if that's not to put words into your yeah. question? It's by getting more steeped in the word and go to go to places like Hebrews 11 9 and 10 for there's a builder who's found architect and foundations are built around a city that is God himself mm. we have to remind ourselves and everyone that hears this we're just passing through yeah. Abraham lived in tents because he knew this was not his home now, I'm not suggesting everyone go out and get a tent and live in it. But it sends a message that the tent pegs, I bet, were even shallow. Mm -hmm. I bet Abraham's tent pegs were ready to be pulled up and move again because he was not wedded to this world. Mm -hmm. This world was not his home. And that whole lineup of faith characters in that wonderful chapter of Hebrews 11 is just an encouragement. Yeah. Man, I love that. Wow, you get me fired up. This is great. <laughs> hey, talk to us about, I mean, it's election year, right? You, you've spent um, much of your life in D.C. Um, talk about the two candidates we have. We have two choices. And how, as Christ followers, should we even approach this election? Well, I won't hide my disappointment yeah. in both candidates. Um, you notice there's a complete absence of debate about their character. Yeah. And in fact, even the debate as it applies to ethics or ethical behavior, which of course is, is interwoven uh, to the creation of what you then say is the character of the person, whether it's uh, Madam Secretary Clinton or uh, Mr. Trump, there seems to be an absence even in the, the, the treatment in the media to the character flaws and the suitability to lead our country. So I, I have to start with my own disclaimer and disquieting concern uh, about that. So then I'm left with, if I look at a, a list, and I'm not a good listing person. My wife is superb at listing things. She lives by a list of things. But if I list out the things where I have, in the one case with Secretary Clinton, someone with vast experience. There's no question. 25 to 30 years in politics, whether in Arkansas or in Washington, ending up with her, with her four-year period as Secretary of State. 
And I ask myself, in all that experience, what have you actually learned that demonstrated a growth that you wouldn't repeat that mistake? Where is the I'm sorry, I really fouled up on the whole question of the reset with Russia mm -hmm. or what occurred in Libya with Benghazi. But rather, it's this defensive, you know, I, I was successful because I was Secretary of State. That's a circular reasoning. Mm -hmm. Because I held the position at DIA did not make me successful at DIA. Mm -hmm. And I would leave it to others to judge the, the, the measure or the determination of that success. So that gives me concern. In the case of Mr. Trump, you have one who almost at her own peril um, gloats at no, not knowing facts mm -hmm. about the world. I don't, I don't think that that's a, a prudent approach to the kinds of issues that I've looked at and, and uh, been dedicated to in my professional career by way of looking at the world and saying, ah, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, they're, 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 they're a basket case. We don't need them. I mean, this sort of, uh, uh, and a very strong current of isolationism, that somehow the world is as he wishes it to be rather than it actually is. Because as you and I have talked before, as recently as an hour ago, nature abhors a vacuum and a world of where we know principalities are at work in the, in the ether, as you might say. That space will get filled by evil if we're not there as the beacon on the hill that I believe is really an exceptional nation. As not a Christian one in the classical sense of everyone's going to heaven because they've come to a saving knowledge of Christ, but a worldview of helping others mm -hmm from the oppression that they face, as we see in Syria and Iraq and elsewhere, or Russia itself, or China, and on and on and on the list goes, Iran and North Korea, and these transnational groups that I've mentioned. So both of them give me pause. Now, I come back to be anxious for nothing. Mm. Yeah. So what I would ask the viewership mm. and those listening to this is, Think about what are the most important things you might get out of two of the most, if not actually the most unpopular candidates mm -hmm. that the, at a national level that we've ever had in our history. Mm -hmm. How out of 330 million people in America, we ended up with these two candidates? Personally, I'm unhappy with both. Mm -hmm. Personally, I will make a choice. Mm -hmm. I will make it off of my wife helping me with the list. What are the sorts of things that I see one might be better than the other, recognizing that neither would have been my personal selection. Mm -hmm. As you look at this, just the turbulent world that we live in, I mean, the wars that are happening and, and the vying for power from these uh, world leaders that you've talked about, how do we as Christ followers uh, engage in our community in a way that impacts even the greater, the greater world? Well, we have uh, many opportunities to do that, but let me just take one example, and it's the refugee issue. Yeah. Obviously, it's in the news. Um, the whole issue of the 11 million who are um, undocumented in the United States and the whole issue and whether Mr. Trump has pivoted on the issue now and the, the building of the wall and this pertaining to Mexico uh, in particular, but the, the Syria crisis mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to refugees. And I think, I think a, a, a road map, uh, if you unpack it and really peel it back, is, is a verse that I just love, uh, Micah 6, 8. Mm. Oh man, what have I required of you? That you act justly, that you love mercy, and that you walk humbly with your God. I think all too often the church in responding to social issues such as the refugee crisis, it's an all or nothing proposition. Clearly government, the constitution that we have, which is just a, a wonderful document that we ought to abide by, and I hope Antonin Scalia's uh, fill in the Supreme Court is someone who respects the Constitution. So don't, don't take this as, I'm some softy that says, just let it all happen and it will just be fine and our security will be fine. Obviously, I spent my career on security. 
But what can be missing is we turn it into a very black and white answer. It's an all or nothing, let them all in. None of them can come in. They're all coming to kill us. And, and when you think of Assyria uh, as a country in, in, the, in the wake of the Arab Spring in 2011, a country of 23 million mm. with over 400,000 estimated dead today, about 65% of them either internally displaced and the vast majority of those now in refugee camps or headed to Europe or headed here or elsewhere. These are, this is a suffering people. Yeah. Now, that said, where do you balance then? This is the conversation in the marketplace that you're referring to. And I'm yeah. only using refugees as one example. It applies to where do we show compassion and yet at the same time we, we, we message that it, it, there, is, there is an intent by ISIS, ISIL, depending what you call it, to penetrate those refugee channels to do us harm. And we've seen the attacks in Brussels with an, a nexus to that, I believe in Istanbul at the airport, and possibly at the wedding just this past weekend in which 54 were killed by a 14-year-old. So there is a clear balancing that needs to take place, and that's in a, a form of vetting when it comes to the security piece. It's not just open doors. There's a suffering world out there that would all love to come to the United States if given the opportunity. We can't take them all in. Mm. But at the same time, do we show compassion? Mm. Are we making it about when it's other topics where it's the sin in those that have different sexual preferences mm. Or are we making about the sinner also being evil mm. in how we talk about it? Mm. I'm not condoning the sin in any one of these mm -hmm. areas. And I know I'm mixing different metaphors here of how we approach our neighbor. Mm. And everyone's our neighbor yeah. to one degree or another, as the yeah. Samaritan, uh, Good Samaritan story tells us. And so how do you do that? Micah 6.8 is a guide. Mm -hmm. Mercy's root word the, where it comes from in Hebrew is actually forgiveness. Showing mercy is to forgive and forget. Not that intellectually you don't remember the event. It's you do not hold it against that person. Yeah. And that's an incredible story mm. of, of biblical redemption that just weaves through the 66 books of the Bible. Mm. Like from that. Genesis to the end of Revelation. It's a redemptive story. Yeah. How can we as believers mm -hmm. do anything less than Philippians 2, where Jesus coming from the highest mm -hmm. comes and humbles himself as a servant? Mm -hmm. So it's back to your point about humility. Mm -hmm. And I think at times the collective church can be very arrogant in its, in its posture. Mm -hmm. It can be very um, just dogmatic about its positions. Mm -hmm. And it comes across as not only do we dislike and hate the sin, we also capture the sinner mm. in that dislike and, frankly, hate. Yeah. We can't ever do that, no. right? I no. mean, no. you no. said the most important commandment is no. love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and mind, strength, and love your neighbors yourself. There, right. This call to love, and I right. think for all of us as men It's to, radical. Yeah, it's it is. It's a radical... It is. It's a radical changer. Yeah, it is. Right. And, that, yeah. and that's where it is. And if in redeeming the time that you mentioned earlier, that's my passion. It's mm -hmm. how do I redeem the time from a standpoint of seizing the opportunities? You know, and and you, you, you have sort of John Paul Sartre and other writers talk about seizing the day or, mm -hmm. you know, no exit. This is the antithesis of that. Mm -hmm. It's actually using every opportunity in the airports, in the train stations, with your colleagues. So traveling on the road or at home, in your own home with your spouse, wow. uh, since I'm largely speaking to men, to your wives. Yeah. Love on them. Love on them. Mm -hmm. And then your children. And it's a radical gospel. It is. It's a radical gospel. Mm -hmm. Give us two takeaways in this turbulent world in which we live. What, what would you say, just, just short takeaways to men? Men, be of good courage. Mm. Uh, we know the end of the story. Mm -hmm. So my takeaway number one is, as you look at the events in the world, we know they will get worse. Mm. Be it from Matthew, be it in First Thessalonians, be it in Revelation. Go back to Daniel. Mm. It's predictive. Whatever the 70 
second week looks like in, in, in that, you know, what it looks like in terms of the end times. And the rumors and the actual wars will pick up and pestilence and all sorts of things. All the things that man thinks he has under control does not, but God does. Yes. Because we know the end of the story. The other one is, it's interesting, as you, as you thematically go through the parables of Christ, mm. men, what I would tell you is invest in people. Mm. Yeah, 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 I know there's nothing wrong with the new version of the Tesla or the new version of whatever, the Beamer or the house. It, it, it's all going to end. Mm. And there is no funeral procession with a U-Haul behind it. Just, just think about that. Pour yourself into lives of others. And here, Jeff, is since I was a man of, of intrigue and secrets, the secret here is you will be blessed. You will be blessed beyond measure in the degree that you pour yourself, that is what does not return void. That's what Jesus is talking about. Wow. It's not material goods. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. But please, don't be anchored in that. Mm -hmm. The market could be attacked today, tomorrow by cyber, and it's all gone. Mm -hmm. do, do you understand that? So if you're putting your faith in anything, but Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, and then living out that process of sanctification. Yeah. That's my second takeaway. Yeah. Pour yourself into the lives of others, knowing that we know the end of the story. And it actually gets worse mm. before it ultimately not only gets better, <laughs> is made perfect. <laughs> yes. It's a new world and a new, a new earth and a new heaven. Yeah. It's a new world. Yeah. And where Christ will reign supreme forever and ever and ever. Mm. Amen. And Amen. to the glory of God. That's that. my message to him. I love it. I love it. David, what do you want your legacy to be? Well, I've kind of given it away with the, yeah. the two takeaways, is that people will say about the dash on my tombstone, if they say anything, mm. well done, good and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. That God will have used me for his honor and glory to rescue the perishing and to build up his church. And I'm not talking about a titled name church or denomination. His church, his bride. And that I will have contributed to it in some small way. I have a heart for young people. They inherit this should the Lord tarry. And I think persecution is coming to this land. It's already occurring in, in these free zones of speech and all this other stuff that I never knew about. I'm on a board of trustees of a Christian college where the sexual orientation is our number one topic as to what to deal with. How am I faithful in carrying that out to the glory of God? That's why, and it's the dash on the tombstone. Whether I perish today or I perish in the statistical number of 82.5 years, it doesn't matter. Those are two years. 1959 was established in Cochabamba, Bolivia. There's another year over here, and it might be 2016. It might be 2032. It doesn't matter. It's what's in the dash to his glory. That, and, and if it's an unnamed tomb, that's fine. We're just passing through. I want that to be the legacy of the shed name coming through this, this earth. He wasn't attached to this world. Mm -hmm. Notwithstanding positions he held, titles, they, they don't matter to me. Mm, I love that. That's it, Jeff. <laughs> love your heart, David. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for just being here and sharing with us and challenging us. And um, What a privilege to be yeah, here. Thanks. Wow, that was an incredible interview. Um, we could have watched it for, we should have a part B of David yeah. Shedd just to hear more from his awesome. heart and what God's done in his life. Um, so there are a couple questions maybe that came in, and so we're going to figure out what those are and how we might apply the words that we heard today. First question is, I'm going to look at, maybe it'll be right here. On our handheld devices. Got it. Okay, so uh, David mentioned uh, living in the world and not of it. We know that's a Christian buzz phrase taken right out of the Bible. Uh, what does it really mean 
Well, good question. Mm -hmm. We all grapple with that. Mm. Um, when, when I think we, we talk about a lot, just like being in the world and not of it and what it means. And just on a really simplistic view, I think you can take that and say, okay, um, if I were to go to another country, you know, go on a mission trip or go on a vacation, I'm spending time in another culture, it would be pretty obvious to all yeah. of the locals, all of the natives, this guy's an American. Um, it, it would be obvious. Mm -hmm. um, we know that from the beginning of time, God has called out and separated for himself a special group of people that's believers in the world today. It should be obvious to people around us. I mean, it, we should stand out. There should be a distinction. So the way that we live, the way that we move, the way that we act, the way that we converse, the way that we conduct business, the way that we lead our families should make us stand out to a degree. Um, and that's, we live in this world, we live in this culture, um, but we're not of it. Our lives are to be different. So. Right, and he, he mentions the process of sanctification, mm -hmm. and, and that word sanctification, when you break it down, it, it means to be made holy, and that word holy means to be set apart. So the, really the process of sanctification is the process of being set apart. The church is never meant to look like the world. We're, we're always meant to look in direct opposition, in fact. And so as men of faith and as we lead our families and teaching our kids, what does it look like to look different? What does it look like to be set, set apart? So in some ways, we're, we're hitting the ground every morning going, okay, God, this is your day. How do you want me to live? What do you want me to do? Who do you want me to interact with? How do you want me to show your love to the world today? Um, we're doing that. And then, and then being okay at the end of the day, that our lives look different. I think that there's a, for believers, there should be an unwavering uh, allegiance to Christ, mm -hmm. but then also confidence in Christ so that um, the news isn't scary, so that November for us isn't scary. Um, like David was talking right. about, you know, be anxious for nothing. And I love how he highlighted gratitude yeah. in that, that, yeah. that gratitude is a remedy for anxiety. Um, so uh, here's another we have one. another one. It says, uh, you can take it. How do we reconcile the call to pray for our enemies um, and be anxious for nothing. Oh, we just said that, gratitude. Um, and yet still deal with the righteous anger that we feel over evil in the world um, and even evil within our own country. Yeah, I mean, we all know that we live in a broken world. From the beginning, um, when sin entered the world, we knew that that affected everything from then on out. And, and so we do live in a broken world. The, the, the question is, how do we deal with it? How do we, out of, Jesus talked about fear a lot. And um, out of the 120 commands that Jesus gave, 21 of those, he spoke about fear. Fifteen times Jesus says, do not fear. And what I believe he was getting at is do not fear the one who can, control, who can destroy the body but cannot destroy the soul. It's really a faith versus fear perspective, mm -hmm. you know. The other part about is, and this I can take just about anything and make it simpler. Um, you know, you and I are just brothers and friends and partners in ministry, um, but you're Courtney's husband, I'm not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're Kit's dad, I'm not. Um, so there's things about your life that, that belong exclusively to you and God's call on your life. Um, there's things that belong exclusively to the Lord, you know, so we're co-heirs with Christ, we are partners in ministry, we get to be um, brothers of Jesus conformed in his image every day by the grace of God, but there are certain things that belong to him and him alone. Mm -hmm. um, vengeance is the Lord's. Um, and when I realized that it's not my job to punish the world or to judge the world or to um, hold that, it's, it belongs to God. And so he's going to right the wrongs in the world. Right. And that's a freeing thing because it's, it's, it's not our job to be angry about those things. That's the Lord's. He's grieved over it. He's angry about it. Um, we're called to be salt and light in it. And so when we figure out this part is our job, what we're called to, and this part is what he reserves for himself, that's kind of a freeing thing too. Yeah. I think about. So. And whenever I think about it, it says the call to pray. Whenever oh, yeah. I think about that, that call to pray, what God has been teaching me is praying from a place of desperation because I need, I need him to show up on my behalf. And whenever we, we pray, I believe prayer leads, leads us to the point of submission. Mm -hmm. That um, the, the longer we pray, the more we pray, that that leads us to a place where you, you really say, okay, I, in, a, in a world that seems to be out of control, he has everything under control. Yeah. There you go. Yes. Yeah. Two questions. We could continue to learn more, and, and we will, because this um, interview, along with all of the other MLN interviews that we have, is they continue to be available. Um, later today, we'll have an MLN Rewind come out via yep. email. Um, it's going to have a link to this interview, plus... 
um, the 30 plus interviews that MLN has hosted over the years, um, even a book link to a resource that will help us in our leadership. Yes, and exciting. Next week, Joel Barone, he, he's a partner here at Rolling Hills. He's going to be with us. He's the vice president of the group business management uh, merits, and he's discussing the, ch the changes um, f face, uh, f the changing face in, in level leadership, which I'm really excited about. Joel, I think he's an awesome leader. I um, love um, spending time with him, and we'll begin next week, 6.30, um, for breakfast, start at 7, and then uh, we we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Have a good day, guys. Thanks, guys.